Welcome everyone to Half History Will Travel. I am your host, the Wilder Historian, and the patrons over on Patreon chose the Battle of Perryville to be animated. I want to make it clear that some of the positions of the individual regiments are unknown. Therefore, I have placed them where they most likely would have been. If you'd like to vote on which battle to be animated, please join the Patreon page for as little as $1, and you can cast your ballot. I would also like to thank you all for helping me get 20,000 subscribers. I am greatly humbled by all of your support. In September of 1862, the states of the Union were experiencing an invasion by two Confederate armies, Robert E. Lee's Army of Northern Virginia in Maryland and Braxton Bragg's Army of the Mississippi in Kentucky, not to mention Edmund Kirby Smith's Army of East Tennessee, who Bragg was hoping to link up with in Kentucky to defeat the Union forces there. Once Bragg entered Kentucky, Don Carlos Buell's Army of the Ohio gave chase into the Bluegrass State. Bragg could have engaged Buell around Louisville, but decided to link up with Smith, who was near Lexington and Richmond. Bragg himself went to Frankfurt and installed a Confederate governor and then rejoined his army southwest of Lexington. Buell secured Louisville and marched toward Bragg's army concentrating near the town of Perryville. The Battle of Perryville opened at about 3 a.m. on October 8, 1862. The two sides began deploying troops and filling out one another's position on the ridges northwest of the town. Some Arkansas troops under St. John Liddell engaged with Colonel Daniel McCook's brigade and the battle lines began to form. By mid-afternoon, Bragg believed he knew where the Union left was and hoped to outflank the blue troops and compromise their position. The plan was for Major General Benjamin Cheatham's division to strike that flank and roll it up while the rest of the Confederates put pressure on the center and right of the Union line. Maney's brigade of hardened veterans were on the Confederate right, tasked with turning the flank. The Union bolstered the ridges with artillery supported by infantry. Terrell's green troops were the first to contact Maney's men. Seeing the Southerners approach, Terrell sent the 123rd Illinois to blunt the enemy's advance, but the Southerners were advancing quickly and firing on the march, which sent the new Union troops into flight all the way back to the ridge occupied by Starkweather's brigade. The Union artillery began firing double canister, making Maney's troops lie down on the slope, load lying down and then stand to fire. Although in a prone position, the Confederate bullets wreaked havoc on the Blue Gunners and the 105th Ohio. Maney took the 1st Tennessee to the right in order to outflank the Union troops pinning down the rest of the brigade. Bragg could tell from the brutal stalemate that his men had not approached the Union from the left flank, but instead hit it head on. Therefore, he reluctantly ordered up more troops, those under Alexander P. Stewart, to support Maney's left flank. The Tennesseans successfully flanked the Federals, allowing the Confederates to take the ridge. Moving down the slope, Maney's brigade kept up a brisk fire on the Union troops on the ridges in front of them. Starkweather had placed the 400-man 21st Wisconsin down the ridge to blunt the Confederate attack, but the Green Wisconsinites, positioned in a cornfield, couldn't see the enemy troops approaching, and Terrell's stragglers ran through their ranks. A crash through the cornstalk signaled the attack on them by the Gray troops. The Southerners scattered the new recruits and approached the Union-held ridges but the fire was too rapid in their front to attack the position. Maney begged for artillery and reinforcements, which took up a position on the ridge behind him. One of the Confederates who came to help wrote about the carnage he saw on the first ridge. The ground was slippery with blood. Many a poor, dark-looking, powder-begrimed artilleryman was laying stretched out upon the ground around us, torn and mutilated. Once again, Maney called upon the 1st Tennessee to make another flanking maneuver. The concentrated attack of Maney's main line and Stewart's brigade pushed Starkweather off the ridge and back about 300 yards, but the Confederates could go no further. They were exhausted, and enemy artillery were watching them intently with guns aimed. To the south, the Confederate lines were pushing up against the Union center and right. The Union troops held a commanding position on a high ridge about 100 feet above where the Southerners would have to cross Doctor's Creek. Donaldson and Jones's brigades began to push back enemy skirmishers as they advanced toward the Union main line. The rebels put up a good fight, but the terrain and heavy rate of fire of the Union small arms and artillery prevented them from going further. 
As Jones and Donaldson's men were brought to a halt, Bushrod Johnson's brigade was sent in to attack further to the south. The bombardment of their movements by Union rifled muskets and the deadly artillery tore into their ranks as they moved up the steep slope toward the Union battle line. The rebels unleashed numerous volleys at the blue troops, but could not budge them, so they fell back down towards the creek. In an attempt to outflank the Federals, Johnson slid his men to the southwest and attacked from that direction, but casualties were mounting and they were quickly running out of ammunition, a problem for many of the Confederate units in this battle. They fell back, but fresh reinforcements were on their way in the form of two brigades, Patrick Claiborne's men from the east and Adams' Louisianians from the south. On the ridge, the 3rd Ohio retired and the 15th Kentucky took their place with fresh troops and full cartridge boxes. Unfortunately for the Kentuckians, the determined Southerners slammed into their flank. The men of the Bluegrass State put up a stubborn fight and caused many casualties, but they were outnumbered and were obliged to fall back. It was around this point in the battle that Union General Don Carlos Buell was becoming concerned about reports coming to him about an engagement. However, he was not hearing any sounds of battle and assumed, since he could not hear the engagement, that it was of no concern. What was actually happening was a unique environmental condition called an acoustic shadow, which carried the sound of battle away from Buell. He did offer a small amount of troops to support McCook's embattled corps, but no sizable force. He had no idea that nearly a third of his army was being decimated and nearly routed. Back on the battlefield, Claiborne and Adams attempted to organize a coherent battle line themselves once they drove the enemy from the ridge but the attack had taken too much out of their men to launch a significant assault against the regrouping Federals. Donaldson moved up his bloodied regiments to help the last push, but it would be Wood's brigade who would spearhead the assault, pushing back the Union lines all the way to the Russell House and only stopping when Gooding's fresh brigade came to help McCook's corps. The two sides killed one another in droves as the sun set, but the men from Alabama and Mississippi were running low on ammunition and the long distance they had traveled to launch the assault depleted their energy. The 33rd Alabama lost 400 out of the 500 men in their firefight with Gooding's men. Gooding lost around 30% of his force and he himself was captured. Luckily for Wood's men, Liddell's Arkansas Brigade made it to the field and replaced Wood's men in the fight with Gooding. As the Confederates began to gain the advantage, Liddell wanted to press on but his superior would not allow that, and thus quiet descended over the battlefield. In comparison to other major battles of the Civil War, Perryville was a small battle. It essentially was a fight between McCook's one Union Corps and portions of three Confederate divisions. It was a tactical victory for Braxton Bragg, but a strategic defeat. He gained nothing significant from the victory, and he would be forced to leave Kentucky by marching his army through the Cumberland Gap towards Chattanooga and then towards Nashville, where he would fight the Battle of Stones River near Murfreesboro, Tennessee. The Union lost 4,211 men. 845 were killed, 2,635 wounded, and 515 missing and captured. The Confederacy lost 3,401 men. 510 were killed, 2,641 wounded, and 251 missing and captured. Totaled up, that amounts to 7,612 casualties. Thank you all so much for watching the video. I hope this animation clarified the role and positioning of the troops involved in this battle. I will be putting up a poll on Patreon to vote for the November animation. December will feature Fredericksburg, and late December, early January will be Stones River. Thank you all again. Have a great day. Historian, historian, where do you roam? Historian, historian, far, far from home. Have history will travel, he's the card of a man. A professor with knowledge in the heartland. To educate the world. A professor of fortune is a man called Historian Historian